Thank you for staying with us. Brain drain, otherwise known as JAKWA, is a slang term that indicates a substantial emigration or migration of individuals. A brain drain can result from turmoil within a nation, the existence of favor favorable professional opportunities in other countries, or a desire to seek a higher standard of living. The chairman of the Nigerian Medical Association, NMA Uche Roland, gave a keynote presentation at a symposium to discuss recent brain drain in Nigeria's health sector and its implications on health service delivery, where he said that the official statistics show that as of 2019, Nigeria's doctors to patients ratio is at 1 to 4,900. He said this number has increased as the country continues to lose medical practitioners to developed countries and that Nigeria is in dire need of health workers. He further added that from 1963 to date, Nigeria produced only 93,000 doctors, which is inadequate to cater for the general population. Research among health workers show that the UK and the United States of America are the top two destinations for Nigerian medical doctors to seek work opportunities, with 93% and 83% respectively. The real question is, what is the root cause of the brain drain and why are doctors and health workers living in Nigeria? Please let us hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081 You could also tweet at us at WayShowAfrica1 with the hashtag Ways show hmm. this topic, no man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Dr. Johnson Babajide Oriyomi is an award winning medical practitioner who bagged his medical degree from the prestigious Lagos State University College of Medicine, Ikeja. Dr. Johnson is currently the Director of Clinical and Occupational Health Services at Citron Health, a subsidiary of Ambulance Nigeria, an organization dedicated to quality occupational health and emergency care across Africa. Also, we have Dr. Safina, who is a Nigerian medical doctor in the UK, living in a town called Chesterfield, Derbyshire. She had worked for seven years as a senior medical officer in family medicine and then oncology in Lassit, Lagos, Nigeria, before relocating to the UK. She's currently wrapping up her general practice training in the UK to work as a GP. She's passionate about medicine, humanity, and passionate about Nigeria as well. So I'm glad that we have two doctors speaking to us today you about know, this jackpot you know, of Sheila, doctors. I, I did mention on Monday, mm. I didn't even know that we Wednesday were going to, I today. said, we need the doctors to come in to tell us how they're feeling because up until now, we've been talking about, oh, this is a major, major epidemic going, yeah, going on, on in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. What is going on and how are the people who are directly involved how are they feeling about it? Yeah. So I'm really glad that I was here. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Having this conversation. To have this conversation. <laughs> it's it's really it's really painful, Chinelo. I took a story on Monday that mm. said uh, we have about eleven thousand yes. and fifty five mm -hmm. Nigerian trained doctors currently in the UK. Yeah. Imagine that That's number no in UK alone. You're not talking about all the other, other countries, countries there, Canada, yeah. all of mm -hmm. them. So mm -hmm. it's 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 something that we need to discuss. <sighs> anyway, Dr. Johnson is glad to have you here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Johnson is drinking you. water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, please, thank you. <laughs> At least thank God that we have him yeah. here. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, we have Dr. Safina <laughs> who is going to check the diaspora angle to it. <laughs> and tell us why this is actually happening. Hello, Dr. Safina. Welcome to the show today. Hello, thanks for having me on as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, like you said, it's a topic that's quite close to my heart. I'm quite passionate about it. So, yeah, uh, 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 looking forward to you know engaging on this. Absolutely. Uh, okay. So first things first. Let's start from here. I remember the person was saying something before we came on. He said. 95% of your mm -hmm. classmates yeah. have now left yeah. the country. So mm -hmm. let me start from there. Why is this? All right, so for me, I think the first root cause is um, the financial remuneration that comes with um, practicing medicine in Nigeria. Mm. All right, um, I think it's really, really bad. Um, the economic power compared to the buying um, price in the market yes. is, is not that power. And like they say, you cannot carry your license to go and buy plantain in the mm. market. So you, get, you need to eat, you need to feed the family, you need mm. to rent the house, you of know, course. and that really for most people is not working. But if you go abroad, you know, you can, you know, make enough to basic meet needs. your basic needs, you know, stuff that are just basic. I think second for me will also be, um, and I think for most people is the fact that they don't have, so you have the skills, you've learned, mm. you're passionate about this medicine, but you get into where you need to work. There are no equipments mm. to work with, all right? So 
you want to save this life, like but you don't have handicapped. exactly. Mm -hmm. You're literally your hands are literally tied right. because you can't do what you know how to do. Yeah. You know, and that for most people can be saddening and depressing. Mm -hmm. You know, so most people just say oh, instead of me staying here where my skills I cannot use it as much as I want to, let me just go to where I have all the equipment that I need and I can save as much life as possible. And I think thirdly is going to be the issue of insecurity. Hmm. You know, and when I say insecurity, it's not things happening at the north. It's even within the hospital yeah. setting. Yeah. You know, there are stories of. Um, patient relatives stabbing doctors, mm. beating doctors up. I've wow. seen doctors being beaten up wow. by patient mm. relatives before. You know, the, the doctor now became the patient, <laughs> you know, just because he was trying to save a life, you know. So oh I, I think for those three mm. things, are, at least from my experience, are the top three reasons why people why are really doctors leaving, yeah. are leaving. Okay, so Dr. Safina, let me hear from you. Why do you think doctors are, why do you think this exodus is happening in the country? Okay, so uh, I mean, like Dr. Johnson said, you know, the first thing is that financial remuneration. If it's not there, you know, there's a limit to how long any individual, no matter how nice or how humane you think you are, you know, you can continue to remain in an environment where you feel that, you know, you don't feel well remunerated for your skills, yeah. you know. So, no matter, the truth is, a lot of us went into medicine we're passionate about medicine, we're passionate about helping people. In quotes, you're you're a nice person because you want to help, you know, sick people. And but somehow when you're placed in an environment where you're seeing a lot of people die, you're seeing a lot of people, you know, not get access to medic um, medical care because they can't afford it. You know, again, ninety five percent of people in Nigeria pay out of pocket for health care, yeah. which is very, very unsustainable in no matter how, you know, developed the country is. Mm -hmm. So you're watching people die, you're watching people die because they can't afford drugs. You're watching people die because they can't afford to pay for, you know, hospital bills, yeah. admission costs, operation costs. And, you know, so there's a limit to how much you can take. And after a while, yeah, it does get, it gets to you as an individual, it gets depressing. And uh, you just start to say, okay, where else can I work where I'll be well supported, I'll be well paid, and I get to see medicine being practiced, you know, in a standard, in a standard manner as it should be. Okay, so yes, it's uh, it's a lot of factors, but definitely the finances, both on the side of the healthcare professionals and even seeing our fellow loved ones, you know, the people in the population we're serving. You know, seeing them die, seeing them not be able to get the right, I mean, to think that people are still dying because they can't afford hospital bills of 50K, 100K. Yeah. And it's ridiculous. And then now, comparing it to a system, of course, healthcare systems are different, but comparing it to a healthcare system where, you know, someone complains of headache and they've literally done a CT scan and MRI and mm. without paying a penny from your pocket. It's, it, it's, you know, like I said, it's it's only a matter of time before you start to say, you know, this is, in a way, absolutely ridiculous and in medicine should not be like this. Mm. <sighs> okay. It's interesting that Dr. Safina brought this up because I had a conversation with a friend, mm. uh, with, a, with family, this evening, she said she was having some headache and stuff. And I said, oh, have you been to the hospital? And she said, yes, she was in the hospital. And um, she was asked to do a CT scan. And she was like, oh, the money. <laughs> because the out-of-pocket experience yeah. is no joke yeah. at all. When you see how people have to pay. Wait, that's why maybe people think that people don't consider their lives here in Nigeria. Because when you think about just me alone having to spend all of this yeah. for health care no we have more oh, dire yes, needs mm -hmm. to take care of and that's what they concentrate on and then you see people get to the point where it's so bad that oh we can't help this situation mm -hmm. and we don't have to live like that and it still goes back back to governance yeah. being able to put in the right kind of structure yeah. and i will always come back there because like I was saying on Monday, I said, why is the government is trying, they put up a bill, a bill saying, oh, doctors must practice spend practice five, five years. years. And it took me back to when I was in the university, I had a lot of doctor friends. Mm -hmm. Currently, most of them are in Canada or in UK or in the US. 
And I have one in particular that says, no man, nothing is going to bring me back to Nigeria mm. <laughs> for no reason. He has lost some family members who did not have any business dying the way they did. Mm -hmm. And he said, Noma, I'm not coming back to Nigeria because not, Nigeria has nothing to offer to mm -hmm. me. And I'm asking myself, why hasn't the government had the this conversation yeah. with the people who are, you are coming up with a bill. Do you, how does it affect the doctor? Do you think of that? Is that the best incentive to keep our doctors in Nigeria? Back. So my question, I mean, to you, Dr. Safina, and also to Dr. Johnson, is what can the government, what's the government not paying attention to when it comes to our medical space? What are they not paying attention to? Okay, so... Mm -hmm. I can start with Dr. Safina, okay. then we'll come back to you. Okay, yeah, thank you, Norma. You know, like you rightly said, you're, it's, it's a... It's, it's like, you know, using a sledgehammer to kill an ant, okay. you know, or sometimes I don't liken it to an abusive relationship mm. where instead of the person to do what is right and make the partner stay, you decide to lock the doors and you say the partner should not escape. Mm. That's, that's, you know, it, it, in no way does it make sense. So now and to answer your question about what the government can do, first off, if you want to keep people you know, at the end of the day, because what this has just shown is that ev everyone has autonomy, you know. I can decide after I've stayed in my own country, to I can decide that I want to go somewhere else. If I'm not being served, if, you know, you're not if I don't feel fulfilled, you know, as an individual, as a career person, you know. So what can you, the government, do? I don't think it's right to now say you want to make me or let me say my colleagues back home sign a contract or some kind of bond absolutely that's i don't think that still obtains you know so what can you do instead of course we call it softer skills or softer ways of you know handling professionals or handling you know uh, institutions first off every like everyone has, has said <laughs> salary is a major thing you know salary is a major thing and of course you know this it, it also cuts across board you know other professions teachers nurses other healthcare professionals, you know, the police. The, so, yeah, we need a major overhaul mm. when it comes to the salary structure in Nigeria. And, of course, not just salaries. What are the conditions under which these people are working? How can you say you're working in an A&E? &E? When I was, I did a posting in A&E, &E, I never saw a defibrillator. Mm. <laughs> used to wow. Start. Wait, I'm going to touch on that. <laughs> Please. Oh, my goodness. Exactly. Oh, wow. I never saw a defibrillator. And, and, you know, now, having done a &E here, I'm like, he was just God, I was saving, my, <laughs> saving my license and saving, you know, the people, the patients that came in. Honestly, you're talking oh. about doing ECGs for patients with, uh, coming with maybe cardiac chest pain, for oh, example. Boy. That's basically a heart attack. And these are, <laughs> my colleague and I were laughing the other day. You do one ECG, and that ECG can probably last a month. So hmm. that's a rhythm of the heart strip you know, a, a month or, you know, a week. And then the next time the patient is coming to clinic, you're like, oh, you know, oh, okay, you've looked at it. Okay, it's fine. Or, meanwhile, I'm now in a system where literally you're doing ECGs Every before we send the patient out of air. You have to do it. <laughs> at least two ECGs. Yeah. And that's in the space of four hours hmm. alone. So, you know, it's, it's just amazing. That's why I said God really loves you know, Nigeria. In fact, <laughs> we're just surviving on God's grace in this country. Oh my God! <laughs> you know, perhaps we can't take you know the spiritual out of it mm -hmm. because it's amazing. You know, so yeah, make the conditions right. Put the basic. You say you have you have a hospital. You say you have A and E. You say you have ambulances. Let them be well equipped. You know, look yeah. at standard. There are standard operating protocols everywhere. Mm -hmm. Not just, you know, in, in other professions, even in medicine. Mm -hmm. There's a standard that should be in an ambulance. There's a standard. So, you know, even if you don't have it in Nigeria, they say we follow WHO. WHO is our standard. Mm -hmm. So, look at the, go online, look at the standard. What is the appropriate thing that's supposed to be in an ambulance? What is supposed to be in an ear? Do you understand? Yeah. Don't just bamboozle everybody and say you've opened a hospital or you you are you are a government <coughs> hospital. Like the one in Oya. 
Exactly. So you know, that's have... just the tip of the iceberg. But yeah, and uh, of course, I'm quite keen to hear what my colleague has to say as well. Oh yes. Okay. Well, what's it for Dr. Johnson? So I think I'll start from. Um, what the government should have done yeah. right so when it comes to policy making in healthcare there are two strategies push and pull all mm -hmm. right the strategy the best thing to do is to use the pull strategy not the, not the push like they've done so push means oh we are going to lock you in nigeria for the next five years you cannot go anywhere but nigeria is you always finding yeah exactly but the pull um, is you know get the incentives in place increase remuneration you know push strategies mm -hmm. in place that will want to make people stay without mm -hmm. you even saying so that is what they should have done and when we say incentive in interestingly research has shown that most um, workers or people employ employees as it mm, were mm. it's not really about the the salary in itself it's about the benefits that come comes with working, mm. working. But imagine yeah. hazard hazard PR before was five thousand they've increased increased to thirty two thousand if you get picked by a needle <laughs> of someone that has hepatitis B, you know, we're in Nigeria is about 120,000. Oh compared to the thirty two thousand mm. that's just that's so, that's exactly so what is the hazard hazard fee doing? All right and I've seen doctors suffer this kind of uh, oh, yeah, before yeah. When I was in my house job back then at the government hospital, it happened to a colleague of mine. Thank God for one kind other consultant that built him out. Even though the guy would have been jumping up and down with, um, you know, infectious disease and all. Oh. You know, and then the top of it, top of it for me is getting the right equipment in place in those hospitals. Like she said, you know, what they do is they buy the one AED for the old hospital. They will not keep it. When it's time for audits, they will not bring it back. They will not say that. They will not, not, not say you guys have it. They will not put it back. You know, but the AED is supposed to be in the area, the airport, yes. everywhere, train station, and like I said, SOT should be know everywhere. How to use it. That's, that, these are the issues. You know, they don't even they are not trained in trained. most government hospital um healthcare workers are not trained in basic life support skills, advanced cardiac life support skills, which is in abroad it's very precise, it's standard. You have to know how to do these things. You know, and it's just so the right training, you know, giving them the right training, the right equipment. And then remuneration and incentive is just the right, right way to go. Okay. Pull and then don't, don't push Instead people away. Pushing. And interestingly, their, their policy is just a joke because the UN says, there's a rule in the UN that says that every human being has the right to seek um, medical no, welfare in a better country okay. if you have the capacity uh, to be there. Thank right. you. All right, so thank right. you. Policy for five years is just, it, it doesn't, doesn't fly anywhere globally. Okay, I like, I like where this conversation is going, but then let's quickly take a break. And when we come back, we'll continue from the conversation. If you are just tuned in, we are discussing the topic brain drain, aka Jackpot, why doctors are leaving Nigeria, and we're discussing with Dr. Johnson Babajide Uriyomi and Dr. Safina Aldu. Please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 0818038-4663 or Twitter to us at Wish Africa One with the hashtag Wish. We're talking about the NHS. <laughs> I can't believe oh what my, my ears have heard today. No, I actually understand because I have a friend who is a medical doctor and he's okay. not practicing you wanted to say was oh actually was <laughs> because he's, not, he's no longer practicing you know, yeah. he's, no he's doing um consultancy now okay. with them um, I, I don't know what they're called some ngo okay. thing like yeah. that in abuja that's what he does now and then i ask him he's like you know please i'd rather do this than practice medicine in this country and i'm like it really is that bad because think about it you go to school for that long mm. You, you're in university for what, five years I or six years? I was touch yeah? on that. You do housemanship, you, come, you go through that whole rigorous process, you come out, and then at the end of the day, you're not remunerated. Really and um, now rightly. they're telling you yeah. five years. If I'm the one, a boy, I'm going to leave. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I can completely understand where you're coming. But then I want to touch on that, what you, what, what you just said. Okay, so um, what I was discussing at the back end was yeah. the NH NHIS scheme and how it's not really functional, as mm -hmm. it were, because... Mm -hmm the amount that the eventual hospital, because the way insurance works is you pull money together and then, and then when you get sick, you know, you go to an hospital and then they get paid. Yes. But the amount that these hospitals Please get paid to offer money. you care is not really what and it is. And how much is that amount? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so some, some is as low as 700, 800 there, you know, yeah, that some of these hospitals get paid. So imagine you're going to assess care at the private hospital and you, is it under yeah, the opinion? Sure. What would they give you? What, what quality of care do you expect? But the good thing is, and I must mention this, you yeah. know, for because this initiative is doing well. The one that Lagos State Government is doing, um, Ilira Eco um, okay. initiative, yeah, yeah. is yeah. really, really amazing, you know. And I think that's that's the way to go. Instead of depending on a national health insurance, so scheme, let the states yeah. pick up their healthcare system and build it for, by themselves. 
And that's that's honestly the way to go. Hmm. But then why opinion. do we why do we even have to wait for the states to pick it up? Why I mean, yes, I can understand that, right? But then there's a reason there's also a national board across to be able to cover all of the country. So that doesn't even that doesn't well that's not create excuses for them and say, okay, because Lagos State is no 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 no. The federal government should do something right about our healthcare system. And I like what Unoma has been saying, for everything she has said, it has always still come back to governance. True. And that's why we always talk about governance and on the show. Because, because those are the people that we have to hold accountable. Yes. And if we, they don't know what to do, maybe we should let yeah. them Tell know. them. So in that light from Chinel, I wanted to ask, what needs to change in the healthcare system in Nigeria? All right, so it's policy first. And then mm. the allocation of the budget. The amount being allocated to healthcare in Nigeria is about uh, 1.2 trillion, just about 5%. And the target should be at, at least 15%. So imagine can't really do much mm -hmm. and these things are driven by money like it or not all right yeah. so imagine uh, before it was about 4.7 percent it was very horrible numbers mm -hmm. but now at least it's improving but it's not there yet so we need to allocate more money to the healthcare system healthcare education this basic stuff compared to you know putting all the money in some people's salary people in government salary you know mm -hmm. uh, and they take the bulk of the budget let this percentage come to healthcare second is policy like you've been mentioning and and governance and all those yes. things Put the right policy in place where healthcare is concerned. Healthcare policy in Nigeria is is mm -hmm. nothing to write them about. Mm -hmm. You know, so we need to sit down, have policymakers come, have conversations around these things, you know, and then build the right policy that can help us move forward. Okay. All right. Um Dr. Safina, we've, we've we've heard from um Dr. Johnson who is in Nigeria, right? So now I want to ask you, <clears throat> you've seen how um the healthcare system runs in the UK. Right? How do you think we can implement that in Nigeria? Okay. So, what I would, you know, one of my recommendations, having, like I said, worked both home and now abroad, mm, uh, I'm, I'm a clinician. So, meaning that, you know, I'm not in admin, I'm, I'm very patient facing, I deal with patients. Okay. okay. So, aside the, all the things we mentioned, health policies, remuneration, I think also the culture of, what I would like to call the senior colleagues, like those you met in the game, so to speak, you know, it also has a way on impacting those that are coming into the profession. Yeah. I'll give you an example. For example, when I was doing my internship in, you know, in Nigeria, I trained in Nigeria and, um, you know, I did house job in Nigeria. So that's your internship period. You know, I remember literally starting on my first day at work and they were expecting me to know everything. I was expected <laughs> to know, oh, how to do this, how to take blood samples, how to see patients <coughs> with chronic illnesses, how to see someone that has been macheted and all of that. And now that I've seen, you know, another healthcare system, mm. I'm seeing that you, you can't, Rome was not built in a day. Mm. There's a reason why you're an intern. There's a reason why you're a junior, colleague, um, junior doctor working under a consultant. So you have more experienced colleagues who are supposed to, you know, sort of show you the way, show you the ropes, allow you gradually develop or build yourself. But, you know, it's like <laughs> you start off from zero to hundred in Nigeria. You know, here you have something called a shadowing period. Literally any job you start, you know, in the UK, there is something called a shadowing period. So where you get to observe, so sometimes you might not even be seeing patients. You might not even, you know, but it's just that gradual introduction. See how we do it oh, before you come in, mm -hmm. before you, you're allowed to start to do things. Mm -hmm. And not in a, you know, not in a demeaning way, but more like you're, you're new here. So we're not expecting you to know everything, Thanks. you know. So that's part it's of what okay I'm, not to know I mean everything. by the culture. Yeah. So, and then, you know, of course, even things like, you know, that's, you know, so it's, you can't, I, I'm a big believer in the fact that you can be better than this, the environment you're in, unfortunately. Okay. So in as much as you're trying your best, you're a hardworking doctor, you want, you love people, you want to save the whole world, you know, what, what is the structure that you found on ground? So I believe our senior colleagues have a lot, a role to play in this area. Mm. I don't think it's by doing policies and saying people should stay in the country. No, when we were, you know, when it was our turn, when we were junior doctors, we were not even driving cars. Mm. You know, you hear senior colleagues saying things like that. And I'm like, is that what it was the meaning of that? 
we were not even driving cars. These young doctors, all they want to do is drive cars and look <laughs> nice. It's the mentality. You're like, the is that what we're talking about? You know? Yeah. yeah my I, the my supervisor my clinical supervisor like i said i'm in a, i'm a clinician so i see patients you know my clinical supervisor will tell me if he sees that the way i'm looking i'm looking stressed i'm looking like, are you sure you don't want to take a day off i said hey, they're asking me if i want to take a day off <laughs> you know like if because he, he will tell you, he will say that if you're not well, you can't see patients. Of mm. course. If your mental and physical health is not all right, you Absolutely. can't now be given what you don't have. Mm -hmm. You know? So it's so that's why I said the seniors have a large role to play. So I don't think it's by oh, expecting a hey, people should stay automatically. No. Mm. You you are you that has been in the game for a while. What are you doing for the younger colleagues? You understand? You see a younger colleague struggling. What are you doing? Are you just there expecting? I don't know how you want to do it, all, but when I come in the morning, 36 patients should have been clapped. 36 <laughs> patients should have, should have taken all the blood samples for 36, you know, all those kind of, and, <laughs> you know, and so you just have, so I, I just feel that, yes, government has a role to play. Policies have to be in place, but even uh, those senior colleagues in the profession, I, I, th I think they have they have a, a big role to mm -hmm. play as well. Hmm. Interesting. Let me add something here okay. that some people, the reason why they decide to leave the country, yeah. why they just absolutely say I'm leaving, is because of some of their experiences with senior colleagues. Mm. You know, because in they some were not cases, given that yeah, exactly. Some cases even even borderline right. bullying. You know, wow. and it's really bad. Some, some people say, oh, no, I cannot face Take this. I need this. to get out of here because of yeah. so. I absolutely agree with that. You know, senior colleagues need to do better when it comes to mentorship and guiding. In people. fact, the conversation just brought out two things for me, and these are things that I just continue to hammer on. Mm -hmm. If who I was here, say, hey, Madam, consideration. Mm -hmm. Two, it's empathy yeah. and consideration yeah. again, because yeah. we don't put ourselves in the shoes of. It's Other easy people. for you to post the bill. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. easy for you to put out policies mm -hmm. because yeah. they don't affect yeah. you yes. directly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when it affects you, then you know. If yeah. you have the heart of the people in mind yeah. in the first place, mm -hmm. then you will put down policies and governance that will guide them in the direction That's... of productivity. Mm -hmm. yeah. If, if it was me, yeah, what I would have, the policy I would like to put in place is a policy that bans medical tourism for politicians. Thank you. And then a policy <laughs> that now does the pool team, which is improve the healthcare system in your country. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll say don't go out of the country for the next five years, whether you get ill or not. Okay, they will And then let's now, <laughs> let's, let's now build the healthcare system. And let's say, don't yeah. say doctors, don't go. Oh, yeah, you too, don't go, go, don't go for medical tourism. Funny enough, you know? that was what I thought when, when I saw that. I was <laughs> discussing with my parents, and I'm like, that's what I think. If you're saying that doctors shouldn't leave once yeah. they finish, then you shouldn't leave for five then years. Then you shouldn't go to get treated. Why well, yeah, Let's stay yeah. here. Mm -hmm. When the doctors were here, were they not still leaving to go get treated somewhere else? Mm -hmm. So now, what is it really? Anyway, now we've come. We've seen. We've <laughs> seen. Circle. You know, we've seen what this has done or what this is doing to our healthcare system. Thank God for these doctors that we have with us today. They've also given us, or rather, they've preferred some solutions. And you see this one that they talked about bullying and senior mm. colleagues. I think that's a very big deal. It because is a very, it's supposed very big to be mentorship, like yes, uh, Dr. Sabina you know, mentioned. Which happens in every profession anyway. If you're new, you start from some sort of internship, right? And then you go ahead, you become whatever it is. Yeah. But there are people that should be able to guide you, people that have been there before, who should have your interests at heart, trying to leave a better leg legacy for mm -hmm. you, right? But as it is, I think uh, the reverse is the case in our dear country. And if I might add very quickly, if I, while Dr. Safina was talking, I was going to ask uh, um, the question of what your experience was, but you had already uh, talked a bit about, about it. it. But the bully part uh, and seeing mentorship, I'm sure that was somewhat of a culture shock for mm -hmm. you. Because here, you everything is hard and complicated, and then somebody said, oh, take a break. Mm -hmm. Oh, are you Okay, Absolutely. you're like, huh? I'm <laughs> so, sure so, you were like wondering what's behind it. Let me give you an example. So, <laughs> you don't want I, I them for... think you're lazy. You're like, ah, no, I can walk. I'm not lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't do it. And they're like, no, there's a reason why you have, you know, personal time off. There's a reason why you have sick leave. Use mm. it. 
because if you're not well, you cannot come and see patients. But you know, the Nigerian in me was very, was very keen Absolutely. to show that I could do it. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, so, so just for me, just for me, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, work, I work with multinationals and I had worked with you know guys from abroad. Exactly. And, and comparing, and what happened was, was immediately after my house job that I started this role, okay. and just at the end of my house jobs, a doctor gave me an extension just because I was friends with somebody that she did not like and she wrote it in the extension letter just like that, that and said you're going to do oh. one extra month in this place no, not paid wow. because you're allowing this boy influence you because you guys are friends and she submitted it to no the government way. Wow. and nothing happened you know so it's that bad there are people that will tell you when you go to them and say i'm not feeling fine they will ask her are you feeling fine now i'm saying am i feeling fine all of us you are not feeling fine <laughs> <laughs> so why, why are you telling me that you're not feeling oh fine goodness, so it's that bad so imagine you get, get into a multinational that has mm. um, a doctor from the uk and is telling you Oh, you it's know, why are you not taking the break? Why, why are you still doing here by five o'clock? You know, you're, you're done for the day. What are you, why are you still here? You know, the shock is, is crazy. And across all the multinationals that you've had to... Yeah. Like, that, that has it's been the, the culture, yeah. Process. Okay. We've heard from the hostels now. <laughs> <laughs> and now we know that we indeed we need to do better in this country. First of all, this bill of saying medical practitioners have to stay five years, no, it should be abolished. We can't... I don't think we can go through this at all. It's not... It's not it's, it's not going to work, let me just put it that way. And like Dr. Johnson rightly said, instead of using the push method, I think we should start approaching it using mm -hmm. the pull method. Start to create incentives, start to make the healthcare sector better, make the remuneration better, and see if these doctors wouldn't, wouldn't stay. I'm not sure they're happy being away from home anyway. Yeah. You know, it's just because... Risking it seems, their lives. Yeah, it's just because it seems like it's a better opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. But if you create this better opportunity, in our dear country here, I'm very sure that they would stay. Anyway, thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for thank joining you. us in the studio today. Dr. Safina, thank you as well. I'm sure that very soon we'll come back <laughs> to this. And I hope that it would be for a better purpose and not because we're still talking about this. But she's passionate, so she's going to bring she, back uh, the passion. <laughs> <laughs> We can't wait to hear her say, guess what, guys? I'm coming back tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, before we go, do ensure you follow us on Instagram at Wayshow Africa. You can interact with us further, drop a comment, and most importantly, follow all our social media engagements. And remember to like, share, comment, and invite your friends and family to watch us and follow us. If you missed today's quote, here it is again. It's time to end the brain drain and move to brain gain. It's time for a great mind of Nigeria to return home. You are the mind we need, doctor. And this is by Deji Olukotun. See you tomorrow at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Bye.